just wanted to give just a just quick introductions to, to us up on the stage right here. Again, I'm David Kane. Uh, I work with partners inside of Red Hat on uh, repeatable assets, solutions, reference architectures for uh, Red Hat's partners in the strategic and OEM space. Uh, hi, I'm Jose Palafox, and I'm the program manager for CNCF contributions coming out of Intel. Uh, so we've got a team uh, contributing pretty regularly to Kubernetes, and uh, we're going to talk about some of that stuff today. I'm Jeremy Eater from Red Hat, the performance and scale team lead for OpenShift and chief troublemaker. All right, so just for the talk that we have today, about uh, 25 minutes here, we've broken up into four distinct units right here. First, I'm going to take you through just a little bit of background and why to kind of set the stage for the talk that we have here. Uh, Jose is going to talk next about futures, uh, kind of where we're going, where we're seeing things in the community, and talking a little bit more about some differentiated services uh, paired with accelerators. And then Jeremy is going to talk through us uh, a little bit about what some stuff's coming in OpenShift version 4, specifically in the networking space. And then we're going to uh, bring us all home with uh, some things that we can consume today specifically with deploying OpenShift on bare metal. And I've got a couple slides right there, an infographic to kind of take us through that. So just a little bit of a background. I don't know if uh, folks here in this room have seen, maybe over the past 10 months, 11 months, there's been a lot, a lot of announcements um, in the greater community here talking about the bare metal uh, cloud market. You know, historically, cloud providers have offered mostly virtualized instances. And what we've seen right now is most of them are offering uh, the ability to consume bare metal instances uh, on their respective platforms right there. And, uh, we, we have a t uh, two analyst reports there, one from Grandview Research that says that uh, by 2025, this is meant to be a $26 billion market with an annual growth rate of about 40%. So, you know, really, really uh, spinning up the tails there. And just examples you know, like AWS, Oracle, uh, the IBM Cloud all have offerings where you can consume this. But it's not just public clouds, um, also private clouds. Uh, OpenStack uh, had its annual conference or semi-annual conference in Berlin uh, just a month ago and the user survey results are summarized right here on the bottom right, which which emerging technologies interest OpenStack users broadly and you know OpenStack is a platform you can install OpenShift slash Kubernetes on. And the top three were containers, bare metal, and uh, hardware accelerators there. So a, a lot of interest um, in both public and uh, private clouds. Um, today, what we've seen, the majority of uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes deployments are, are in virtual machines, whether that be uh, deployed in VMs atop of OpenStack, whether that be in public cloud platforms, or in traditional virtualization like uh, vSphere. And we've seen that uh, reasoning for that is, you know, a lot of folks have standardized on, on these platforms right here, and they've come to rely on a lot of the automation and a lot of the orchestration that these platforms provide. So it's, in some cases, a lot easier to get started with deploying uh, a Kubernetes or an OpenShift environment on virtual machines just because it's a lot easier than finding a stack of bare metal hardware right there. But what we've found is, the interest uh, is definitely growing and deploying Kubernetes slash OpenShift on bare metal, driven by a couple factors uh, that I want to take you through here. Um, certainly from the keynote earlier from Chris Wright, who spent uh, a slide there on, on bare metal, um, one, one aspect is you know, specifically reducing that VM sprawl and cost, having that software and that infrastructure and expense there, um, but also really a lot of these emerging applications right there, like um, a couple examples given, um, we have you know, running databases specifically directly on bare metal or artificial intelligence machine learning or applications that specifically benefit from having targeted access to dedicated hardware devices. We call those you know, workload accelerators there. And definitely in the last ver the version 3.10 of OpenShift with Device Manager, um, we've had um, you know, Numa Awareness, the, the CPU manager right there. So stuff is coming uh, in the upstream and in OpenShift to really start to take advantage of a lot of these specialized hardware devices for that. So um, accelerators are a big thing for us. So when we talk about accelerators at Intel, uh, we have actually a pretty broad portfolio of accelerated, uh, accelerated hardware products uh, to complement our core uh, Xeon offerings. So um, this is just a quick splash of some of them that we have. I think there's probably more 
Uh, but we've made, you know, the Altera acquisition uh, brought with it uh, a lot of FPGAs, and then uh, we've made a number of other acquisitions in the same space um, to expand our portfolio. So when we think about um, how we use these accelerators in production, uh, it's not just as simple as, you know, racking it up and then magically it works. There's got to be uh, some, some stuff we do behind the scenes to set that up. And so um, where we're headed is kind of, you know, adding... Uh, these accelerators and making them schedulable resources inside of Kubernetes or inside of OpenShift. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk through kind of the strategy for that. Uh, you want to jump us forward a little? You can just keep going. So um, if you think about what Intel's role is in, in Kubernetes, or at least what m my team is working on inside of uh, Intel, uh, we take uh, some hardware accelerator or Xeon feature and we try to expose it to uh, Kubernetes so that it's aware and able to schedule against that resource. Um, then we're looking at taking uh, a workload, something like Redis or um, maybe even just a task like compression, decompression or TLS offload, something like that, that we can use an accelerator for. Uh, and then we uh, make changes to the upstream product to uh, take advantage of the accelerator. Uh, once we have that done, uh, we're working with Red Hat on uh, the operator framework. And so our plan is to try and help accelerate the ecosystem around operators, uh, which you heard about earlier today, uh, so that there's a library of common utilities uh, available for people to manage these workloads. And then the last step, I think, where we're going is to help write uh, open service brokers or some way to expose this inside of a PaaS. Uh, so the technology pieces maybe will shift a little bit here, but the general story is how do we take the accelerator feature, expose it to the scheduler, make sure it's consumable, and then make it a developer self-service uh, ordering process for you. Uh, so that's, that's sort of our roadmap. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, we've highlighted two, two examples here that, that maybe are relevant to um, this community. So, um, if you think about uh, our portfolio, we just uh, introduced a new uh, memory medium uh, that uh, we are able to offer, uh, you know, as a, instead of DDR4, or not instead of DDR4, but to complement DDR4 for in-memory databases. So we create this new product. Uh, great, what does that do for us? Now we have to make sure that drivers for it are available in Linux. Uh, so we work with Red Hat and the RHEL team to make sure that the kernel uh, can support this new hardware product. Uh, then in Kubernetes, we write a CSI driver. So this is an extension point in Kubernetes for storage uh, that allows you to use the memory as a storage device. So once we publish the driver, which uh, we just released today, actually. So if you go to uh, the Intel GitHub page, you can, you can find our new CSI driver for persistent memory. Um, we then go and modify the upstream open source products that can use uh, persistent memory. Uh, so in this case, I selected Redis as an in-memory database. Uh, then we'll work with the operator community to, to standardize on an operator uh, and then write the open service broker. So you kind of see we have like a vertical stack of uh, enabling activities that's, that's going through the ecosystem. Um, another example that we uh, brought on uh, is with Istio and Envoy. Uh, so in this case, uh, we wrote a driver for our Quick Assist technology, which can do TLS offload. Uh, then we um, make sure that the upstream products can utilize QAT uh, after exposing it to the scheduler. Uh, and then we're building you know, a community around making sure that this use case uh, can be taken advantage of both on-prem and in cloud contexts. So, these are just two examples. Um, there is a current PR out for uh, some of the changes we've made in Envoy. If you're interested in checking it out, we've added the link there. Uh, so yeah, if uh, these are interesting use cases for you, please please let us know. And I'd love to kind of you know talk to folks afterwards about what's important to you with accelerators because I think this is kind of an an emerging space. I think in at least a cloud native context. So how do we um, you know how we go forward is definitely something we we're looking for feedback on and hoping you can help influence with us. Okay, so yeah, thanks Dave. Um, this morning we had Chris on stage, Chris Wright, and I just wanted to share uh, this slide with you. So I've got some arrows pointing to things that are kind of a feather in our cap because if you're an engineer and you get one bullet on a keynote slide, that's some kind of an achievement. 
We got two bullets on the keynote slide. So we're talking about bare metal here, and we're talking about performance sensitive applications. And enabling those sorts of things are key to our customers, is the feedback we hear, as well as you can, it, the, the tea leaves are pretty easy to read. Public cloud providers are adding accelerators of all kinds as differentiated offerings, such as TPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, those sorts of things are all commonly, bare metal servers are all commonly available uh, in a cloud provider at this time. Uh, okay, so I don't know if you've seen this slide before, but I'm, uh, it's actually mandatory that I show it. And this is a project we've been leading for a couple of years in the upstream along with Intel and other vendors to bring performance sensitive workloads to Kubernetes. Uh, the extent of my graphics design skills is here. And you can see how it, the idea here is just that there's some overlap between all of these high performance um, workloads and the initial work that we should be doing as, as uh, open source vendors, open source developers, is we should be working horizontally to enable whatever workload you want to run to run on top of Kubernetes and OpenShift. Whether it's network function virtualization, which I'll talk mostly about today, and you just saw a presentation on GPUs that was last, last year's land war. Um, and uh, and we're, you know, so HPC and all these other workloads have similar accelerator requirements or similar high performance uh, requirements. So there you go. Coordinate and plumb these generically. Uh, here's some market um, research that we have done and, and some anecdotal feedback we've collected from customers over the last couple of years. This is a kind of an eye chart, so I apologize, but what, I'm trying to make two points. One, there's plenty of overlap um, between the different market segments. As a team, that would be a good place to start because it's super high value. The second piece, which is the bottom graph, is across all these public clouds, a lot of these capabilities already, are, already exist or they are on the roadmap for inclusion immediately. So this is a bare metal talk. We'll stick to bare metal, but all these other cloud providers uh, offer things like this. And I apologize if, if, if anyone's here from a cloud provider and I've got your cell incorrect, see me afterwards and we'll have the flogging. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, here's the second land war for Kubernetes from my perspective. It's, uh, it started about two years ago, and um, we had discussions, maybe even longer than that, we had discussions in the upstream SIG network community around multiple networks. Who here has one single interface on all of their computers and they will never ever need a second one? So let the record show there were zero hands. Uh, so that's why we, like, that's pretty obvious, right? Because I came from a data center provider, every server had like 10 NICs in it. And it was just like, you get a storage network, you've got management network, you've got out of band management, you've got prod, you know, whatever. There's like, and they, each one is bonded, right? So there's like eight interfaces minimum. Uh, it's pretty standard. In public cloud, that's sort of all extracted away from you, but it, let's just say you're building on bare metal which is why we're here today. So we talked about upstream. We couldn't really necessarily come to an agreement on yet on what the, uh, whether Kubernetes needs to know about multiple networks. So there was, uh, it, the Intel team founded a project called Multis, which allows Kubernetes to call more than one CNI driver. That's the main function of it. Kubernetes right now can only call one. Multis can call more than one. With that base of understanding, that project was founded about two years ago. Um, in the interim time, I'm kind of skipping, fast forwarding here, in the interim time, um, the Intel team worked on Multis V1 and V2, and by the way, uh, if I think there were some Multis contributors in the room. Multis is, again, available on Intel's GitHub, all open source and so forth. Uh, we should be able to put you in touch with one of the developers if you have specific feature requests on Multis. Last year at KubeCon in Texas, where it snowed, um, I don't know, I guess I showed up there, it snowed in Raleigh, I just escaped the, uh, the biggest storm of the century down there. And we did a face-to-face -face between Intel and Red Hat because we felt we should align behind some, uh, we should be align behind some open source project and kind of help to break the log jam of what the upstream community was uh, kind of stuck on. So at that time, we talked with them, we kind of agreed, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, agreement that we would work together on the upstream in Multis. And at the same time, we didn't want to leave the upstream community out of the loop. We, we founded a new working group. Dan Williams from Red Hat helped push forward the network plumbing working group, um, which meets every, I don't know, every other Tuesday, I believe, at uh, some ungodly hour. And we, uh, through that community, 
have established some important beachheads in this space. One, we have, so you guys heard a lot about custom resource definitions this morning. We have a V1 of an API spec for multiple network attachments that's pushed into uh, Kubernetes SIG's GitHub org. That took a long time, but that was one of the major deliverables from the last 12 months. So now we have a you know, pseudo standard uh, that vendors can rally around if they need to attach another network interface, here's the spec that you write to and it'll be, it'll be portable, which is I guess the reason for any spec. Um, so Intel worked heavily, heavily with us on that. In fact, we had, um, we had a shared Trello board that the teams um, in, and biweekly meetings so there was a tremendous amount of engagement, not only in the upstream, but also Red Hat and Intel working together uh, on the back end. So that was most of the first half of this year. We finalized the spec. Um, we finally started putting it to work. We have a demo at ONS, which was in Amsterdam, Open Networking Summit, I believe. Right, Dave? Yeah, Dave was there. Uh, Open Networking Summit in Amsterdam, and that showed Multis running on Kubernetes. We actually have Another demo, two other demos, Multis running on OpenShift, uh, and a, so that's like a functional demo, and then we have a performance test of SRIOV, uh, SRIOV on, uh, on bare metal, actually, and that is in the Intel and Red Hat booths. So on Tuesday and Wednesday, we have demos scheduled. Uh, I believe it's, I won't, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get it wrong. We have demos scheduled on Tuesday and Wednesday of both of those pieces of technology. So if you're interested in multiple networks and you want to talk to the guys putting it together, our booth or Intel's booth is a great place to find, uh, a great place to discuss with the folks um, who have the most skin in the game. Okay, finally, what I can talk about now uh, as of OpenShift 4.0, since we announced it this morning, is we're planning on including all of that work from the last year, doesn't go you know, in the waste bin, we're going to include uh, Multis 3.0 or let's just say 3.x uh, in OpenShift 4. We're going to create operators around it. We're going to create uh, device plugins, obviously, along with Intel, and admission controllers. And they're all containerized and so forth. And that's something you can see uh, in the demo. Now, the user interface, let's hope it's not a mess. So what we want to do is add Multis as a feature to, so this morning it was mentioned, I think, by Mike, that, uh, Mike Barrett, that Every Scrum team inside OpenShift has pivoted and started writing operators. Ours are included in that. Uh, and so we have glommed onto the SDN's team, SDN team's work to build a network operator for OpenShift, which if you hit try.openshift.com today, you will get that operator. Um, and we will be a feature in that operator. So you will be able to express through these CRDs an additional configuration and you will be able to plumb fast data path into your pod. Whew. Two years later, we're finally nearing productization and the work's not done, I will admit, there is more to do, but we can finally get fast data uh, and you'll see how fast it is if you stop by uh, Intel or Red Hat's booth. Okay, last bit of the story is some other things we've been working on. So that's like, I don't know, whether it's the left half of my brain or the right half of my brain is overdoing that. The other side is working on the Upstream Resource Management Working Group, which was 2016's land war. And we've got, out of that, delivered, uh, we didn't deliver new metropology yet because Derek has been busy, but maybe he'll get to that. CPU pinning and device plugins, as you know. The other thing that we're bringing into 4.0, which I have known is a missing piece in Kubernetes for since 2015 is some kind of hardware discovery agent. If you've bought brand new Intel chips and your developers have optimized their code for AVX 512 and you're running on a machine that only has AVX 2, you're leaving performance on the table. And the way I like to talk about performance is the faster your, who here, whose developers like their apps to run slow? Who like here, who here likes to spend more than they need to? That's where your performance helps. You will reduce costs, improve density, and you will keep your developers and more importantly, your customers happy. So, 
to optimize where the applications run, we need some kind of hardware bootstrapping agent, which is not, we're not getting any patents on this stuff. It's just, it's pretty, pretty obvious if you ask me. Intel put together a project called Node Feature Discovery, which both us and uh, some other vendors are kind of rallying behind as a tool that discovers hardware and publishes it up through the scheduler as uh, something you can route your workloads with. It currently uses labels. Whether or not it continues to use labels, I don't know. But that will also be in OpenShift 4, and as you can guess, we have an operator for it. So that's what SIG Node has delivered and the resource management working group, um, which we work with heavily with Intel. And then SIG Network has put together the plumbing working group, which, by the way, you should participate in if any of this has rung a bell for you. More than happy to get real, real users in there. I would love to have real users and, you know, playing with these demos and, and giving us feedback. Uh, the CRD spec is kind of an implementation detail. Wouldn't get too much into unless you're really, really like a hardcore engineer. That would be something useful to contribute back to. And then, of course, we've got Multis delivering a Multis 3.x in OpenShift 4.0. So that together should hopefully telegraph the fact that Intel and Red Hat have been working very closely and will continue to work closely, including a hack day we've got tomorrow. Hopefully we'll come up with some other fancy operators and features to help really drive home the fact that OpenShift 4.0 is a self-driving environment even when you've got high-performance workloads. So uh, when we first started this engagement with Red Hat, it was almost two years ago, I want to say. It's right when I started, started at Intel, yeah. So uh, our first goal was just getting a base infrastructure available for test dev use cases. So we worked with Red Hat to divine a reference architecture for OpenShift uh, and then created a solution that would host uh, a couple of get, you know, nodes to get started with so that you could try OpenShift out and get it up quickly without having to you know, do too much manual configuration. So we wrote uh, a fair amount of uh, scripting that is all open source and a part of our, our reference architecture, and then worked with a number of partners to deliver this solution out, which Dave will talk a little bit more to. Um, so I think where we see kind of all this stuff going, you know, is we have this base infrastructure solution that we released uh, with a number of partners, and now with the accelerators, we can begin adding in um, specific variants of uh, hardware nodes that fulfill a certain workload uh, task. So, you know, sort of a workload specific node definition uh, that we can, we can move out through the ecosystem. Yep, here was the original launch of the solution around KubeCon last year, right before that snowstorm in Austin. Uh, this URL here kind of details a 24-page reference architecture as, long as, as well as associated uh, automation through the form of Ansible playbooks that's uh, available on the Intel GitHub page and a you know, two-page executive solution brief to accompany that. And I wanted to just walk you through really what the workflow is, kind of what the automation is with that, with the time that we do have left. Um, really the prerequisite here is this, the hardware is of course racked, stacked, cabled, and powered on. You know, we can't change physics from that standpoint. But, you know, we have the hardware rack stacked and cabled, and at this point you consume the reference architecture and the automation. You identify uh, the management node. Um, we typically have that denoted as either the Ansible installer or the uh, Bastion node. So this is the you know workload deployer node that's that gets identified. You configure and provision it, put RHEL 7 on there, and like I mentioned, those uh, GitHub Ansible playbooks are there to really help you with some of the initial steps right there to configure this as the Bastion node right there. And you, you know, subscribe them and you download and clone those, you know, relevant playbooks that are there. So with the initial reference architecture, we used uh, Arista top of rack switches there. And so we're actually leveraging some, uh, some Ansible code that's there in Galaxy to actually provision and uh, configure those top of rack uh, switch modules there, setting up high availability features like multi-chassis link aggregation, LACP downstream to the individual server nodes, setting up VLAN, spanning tree, all that fun stuff that we demonstrated in the lab right there and built into the playbook so that you just acquire the hardware, you have it you know, available and accessible uh, to the management node and off to town it goes. So after that, we 
provision Red Hat Enterprise Linux on the rest of the nodes that comprise that cluster right there. And so, like I said, the, the top of rack switch um, modules are, are configured. And so at this point, we're going to start two containers right here, just very, very lightweight. One's uh, an iPixie deployer, so it just runs a DHCP and a Pixie server. And we have an Nginx web server that hosts Kickstart files that are uh, provided as, uh, you know, sample and auxiliary material on the GitHub. So you just, it's all contained a part of that repo, and you make customizations there, a container start. And we're communicating through IPMI, waking those systems up, and they're being discovered by the deployer, and RHEL is being deployed on there. Similar to how we use OpenShift Ansible today to denote which nodes are masters, which ones are infrastructures, and which ones are application nodes, we're modifying our Etsy Ansible host file to really accommodate the you know, OpenShift Ansible playbooks, which that's the same tooling and methodology we use currently today to deploy OpenShift on top of um, you know, whichever architecture, it's either virtual, we're just consuming the same native tool sets. We didn't invent or create any new tooling from there. And so we launch you know, the OpenShift Ansible playbooks. It takes about an hour. And then we have essentially our OpenShift cluster built out uh, essentially with uh, three master nodes, three infrastructure nodes, and then uh, five application nodes for uh, high availability. Also, I forgot to mention, we're also taking advantage of uh, OpenShift container storage. So this is cluster containerized for persistent storage workloads in there and all wrapped up and ready to go after the uh, automation is deployed. So, like I said, I work with uh, Red Hat's partners. I don't mean to sound vendory, vendory up here on the stage, but I just want to uh, commend and, and really highlight some of the work that we've done um, with our partners, um, specifically Lenovo, Cisco, and Dell EMC, and calling out just URLs where you can uh, you know, download and, and consume this material today. Uh, partner Lenovo worked with us, one of their initial partners on version 3.5 of the architecture. They've just refreshed that to version 3.9 of OpenShift. Um, Cisco has worked with us on a Cisco validated design here on the UCS platform. This is around April, March timeframe of this year. And our partners, Dell EMC, worked with us on a reference architecture on Dell PowerEdge hardware. And, uh, I want to point, point some of those folks that are, are in the room here today with us. Um, remember, these are validated designs. We do this in the lab on, on real hardware uh, to give folks the, the um, confidence knowing that uh, these are fully validated and vetted. Yeah, and to complement the initial base configuration we've given in the, uh, in the reference architecture, I think where, you know, as I was mentioning before, where we're headed with this is creating a specific hardware types through our Intel Select Solution program, uh, which, you know, helps the uh, OEM community pick up and uh, productize sort of um, workload-specific uh, hardware configurations that will fit uh, hopefully very cleanly right into the initial install of OpenShift that we've described in the reference architecture. So it's a way of, you know, landing the test dev equipment uh, first and then getting comfortable with it and then being able to expand to high performance use cases afterwards. All right. And I meant to do this when we started. Anybody in the room running OpenShift on bare metal in production today who wants to raise their hand? Dev test? Good. Well, I hope I hope this gives you at least some um, maybe examples or guidelines as to, as to you know, the work that we've been doing. Hopefully, that's uh, helpful. One other uh, call out I wanted to make specifically is the OpenShift Commons Slack channel. Um, just you know, I always like to say we grow when we share, and a lot of the folks that worked you know jointly with us on these solutions that I mentioned are, are on those channels right there. So, you know, happy to engage in further conversation after this off the stage or in the interwebs. Um, one more shout out for the booth. Uh, so the persistent memory use case we talked about here uh, will be shown at the Intel booth as well as um, a close approximation to the Istio Envoy story. Um, we weren't able to land uh, all of those changes into the demo that we set up, but we did do it with uh, HA proxy. So it's a very close uh, approximation of what, what you'll see with, with Envoy. Uh, so that's also running at our booth, and then as uh, the guys mentioned, uh, we also have Multis at our booth and at the Red Hat booth. So if you are interested by any of this technology, uh, please come and uh, say hello. We'd love to, love to have a chat with you. Thank you.